We're ready for the start. They're off. It's Friday during Derby Trail season, so it's a good time to be alive and a good time to handicap some races. Jeremy Plunk, Jeff Siegel from First Bet and Express Bet. Welcome into the First Call podcast, where each Friday we take a look at eight weekend stakes races. Jeff, we've got the Risen Star this weekend at Fairgrounds, topping the marquee for the Triple Crown Preps. Coming off a big weekend last weekend where we saw Hit Show rise to one of the top players in the class, perhaps in the Withers. So this is an exciting time. Now it's starting to get good. It is, and I'm lo- really looking forward to the racing around the country. Obviously, Fairgrounds uh, is going to be um, um, well played because there are so many good races there, and of course, the the Risen Star. Uh, but we've got good racing here at Santa Anita. Obviously, Gulfstream yeah. Park's got some good strong fields as well. So I think there's a chance to make some money. And let's not forget Laurel. Now, Laurel's got a great program right. as well. Uh, we're going to do a couple of races there. Uh, they like to stack their stakes races on the same program and make big days out of it. And this one's going to be good, I think. And we'll, uh, we'll hit up Laurel and see if we can make some money there. I spent many President's Day at Laurel as a kid with my dad uh, along the rail, watching the big guys come in from New York on President's Day weekend for the General George and the Barber Fritchie. Now those races are on Saturday. We're going to get a chance to take a look at a couple of those. But those were some good Monday memories at Laurel Park, freezing in the cold and cursing out Angel Cordero back in the day. So (laughs) that was a lot of fun as a kid. Uh, Good childhood, good memories. Uh, We've got eight races on the marquee this weekend that we do want to take a look at uh, here. So let's get to our stakes schedule here on the podcast the fritchie and general george as mentioned first up Gulfstream park's got the royal delta stakes the return of kathleen O. prep for the oaklawn handicap the rays are back and the money they're giving away at oaklawn there's no preps for anything man these are all big time races with big time purses it seems like at fairgrounds a huge stakes day we're going to look at three of them the fairgrounds stakes the rachel alexander where we've got Hoosier Philly, a potential superstar going there. And then the Risen Star Stakes uh, for the three-year-old. Santa Anita's got its feature race, the Wishing Well Stakes. We want to remind you, of course, before we get to handicapping all these Saturday races, our podcast is going to premiere right before the uh, pick four, uh, pick five gets started at Aqueduct on Friday. First post, 120 Eastern. Be sure to check out that pick five with a big carryover, $285,000 in the pick five carryover. Again, starts race number one at 120 at Aqueduct. Be sure to bet that. With first bet and express bet, also a $40,000 pick six carryover. Final six races on an eight race card today uh, at Naira. All right, Jeff, let's get handicapped and let's go to Laurel Park. We talk about the Barbara Fritchie stakes. These are the distaff sprinters, Barbara Fritchie, a grade three stakes, uh, seven furlongs on the main track. And we've got some fillies that are pretty familiar with each other in this one. Yeah, that's for sure. And it's hard to figure out which one to prefer. Um, two races back, swaying to and fro. Uh, won the Willa uh, on the move and beat uh, a good field. And and then, um, you know, she she's pretty good on her best day, which is one of the reasons why she was four to five at her next race against What a Summer. But uh, she got destroyed that day by Philly Despree, who uh, mm-hmm. won that race by five. And before that in the Willa uh, on the move, uh, Philly Despree got destroyed by swaying to and fro. So now uh, whose turn is it to, who, to destroy who? I don't know. Um, but going seven eighths of a mile, I think, Maybe Phil uh, did the spree can come back and, and win again. I like the outside draw. I like seven eights for her. Uh, and I also like the fact that she's run here 19 times and has won 12 races at Laurel. So that'll do for as, as far as I'm concerned. On the other hand, it's way into and fro with six out of eight. So this is a real, you know, kind of rivalry, I think, brewing yeah. here. I think either one could win, Jeremy. But I, I went with the outside oh, play, play this spray, and I think the dog oh. agrees with me. And I, 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 you know, pretty sharp dog, I can tell you that. So I think Phil did this spray can win it. Uh, I like her right back for John Robb. And, and a really interesting race, two outstanding horses for courses at Laurel Park. Really good addition of the Barbara Fritchie. Yeah, Graham was endorsing that pick wholeheartedly. Let's go take a look at the What a Summer Stakes, because as you mentioned, these two are rivals, and 
they don't just kind of like knock each other around. It's like a knockout in the first round for each of them uh, when they match up. In the what a summer, it was all about uh, feed the spree. They turn in feed to spree into the stretch from sway into and fro her forty six point four five half mile and feed to spree is ready to strut her stuff. There she goes. Feed to spree opening up two and a half three lengths. Feed to spree. She's back. Feed to spree in front by three. Feed to spree rebounds to win here. Going away under Xavier Perez. Peter Dupree in the what a summer stakes from swaying to and fro. Then snick it. There's not a ton of speed in this race, Jeff, and I think swaying to uh, swaying to and fro gets a chance on the front end to maybe it be her turn. So this looks like a too deep situation. If you're looking at the multi race, you never like to go too deep because it doubles the cost of your ticket. But in this case, with the results we've seen with these two. The last race tells you it's all feet is free, but the swaying to and fro gets a little pace advantage in this race. So I think this is one uh, where you probably want to end up too deep. Let's turn the page to the general George stakes. Now this is a grade three, seven furlong sprint. This is one of the big races on the Maryland schedule over the years. You, you look at the DeFrancis dash, you look at the uh, uh, Maryland million day. And of course, Preakness day at Pimlico. But when it comes to Laurel park, this is maybe the second biggest day in the calendar year. Uh, the general George is a big one. Seven, furlongs we've got basically a local field this year not a lot of shippers but the locals they've been knocking heads with each other and they've been very competitive as well this is a a really good race because it's got a lot of genuine consistent professional classy horses and there's not one in here that really isn't capable of at least hitting the board i mean that's how deep it is so I went with Factor and in on top. Um, I liked his fire plug win. Um, this that race was six and a half. Seven is like essentially the same type of race, and he's drawn outside. And I want to point out again, just like I did in the previous race, how good Factor it is. Uh, Factor it in is at this racetrack. Twelve starts, yeah. eight wins, zero seconds and zero thirds, which means if he can beat you, he will beat you. Now, sometimes yeah. he gets out of the race and gets in trouble and because he doesn't have a lot of tactical speed. But I like the fact that he's outside. I like seven eights for him. And I liked his last two wins, most specifically his most recent win, when he uh, won with authority and, and, and looked like a horse that's just on, uh, in peak form and can win again. This is an interesting cast because you've got uh, trainer Norm Cash. It's got a ton of horses in here. It uh, uh, goes by Lynn Cash for people who know him. But in the program, you're going to see it as Norman Cash. Uh, he's got Sir Alfred James in here. He's got uh, also he's got uh, who's the other one in here for Cash? Pirate Rick is in this race in Eastern Bay, and and this is the trainer who runs his horses. If you followed Beverly Park through the course of 2022, you know that Sir Alfred James is making his third start since January 29th. <laughs> January 29th. It's only February the 18th, and this will be the third start. Uh, the other horses in here also running. You know, uh, Easter Bay is fresh, uh, which you don't see uh, from this barn that often. Pirate Rick making the third start since January 22nd. So these horses uh, get in form, stay in form for cash, and uh, this is a really interesting race. Uh, if you want to learn more about the General George Stakes, Check out our social media handles for Express Bet and First Bet. We've got a Meet the Contenders video. Gives you a little highlight of each horse and some of their background. So get to know the field for the General George Stakes uh, following on uh, Instagram and on Twitter. And check out that Meet the Contenders video. Let's turn the page now from Laurel Park to Gulfstream Park on Saturday. Gulfstream Park's got the featured Royal Delta Stakes, named for Bill Mott's star mare, Breeders' Cup Distaff winner. My own 16 for the Royal Delta, $150,000 grade three here. Uh, we've got a field to seven, but a lot of eyes are going to be on the two horse in here. Her name is Kathleen O. She's only run once since last year's Kentucky Oaks. Jeff, what do you make of her four-year-old uh, return? Well, if you're a horse for course player, you almost have to play her. She's three for three. All three of those wins last year were stakes races. All three were accomplished by daylight. Now, having said that, I'm not sure. In fact, I'm, no, I shouldn't say that. I am pretty sure that she's not 100% cranked up. Doesn't mean she won't win, but this is the beginning of her campaign. And I do think that, um, you know, that Suge has probably left a little something to work with, although um, she right. won her debut. It's not like she can't run well fresh. And uh, from the two hole, I think she's going to settle in in the second flight and then make her move. Now, I'm not sure there's going to be a lot of pace in here. There are horses that like to go to the front, but they don't have to go fast. 
And Classy Edition, who was actually second to uh, Kathleen O last year in the Devona Dale, has the benefit of a previous run and uh, yeah. over the track here off the layoff. And uh, although I don't think she beat a whole lot, the 96 buyer number she earned in that one turn mile, that win by five lengths, hard to ignore. And whereas I do think Kathleen O is the better of the two, it wouldn't shock me to see Classy Edition win. I think this race might be a little bit more important to her than it is to Kathleen O. It's a good race. These are good fillies. And again, if you like the horse for course theory, you look at Kathleen O and she just owns this track. And um, yeah. even though the work tab is a little light, um, you know, she knows her filly. And I think she'll be fine. I think she'll be tough. If you're handicapping Gulfstream on Saturday, a couple ex, uh, auxiliary notes for you. Beat the host gets week number seven of eight this weekend, where you handicap races from Gulfstream and Santa Anita. The host this week is Michelle Yu from Santa Anita. So take on Michelle, and if you could take her down, you'll get your share of $60,000 in weekly and seasonal prizes. Update on Beat the Host, an interesting thing, Jeff. We are down to one player who has swept the host in all six weeks so far. His name is Tom Bassett. If he sweeps the host two more weeks, he'll get $6,500 in bonus money for sweeping all eight hosts. He's got to take down Michelle this week and Eddie Olchek next week to do it. Just beat him by a dime. That's all that matters. Just have a better win total than them. Uh, so Tom Bassett, now there's a consolation prize in the sweep to host that he's already clinched because he's the last player standing of 4000 bucks. So he's already got 4000 in the kitty. He's played for 2500 more. And Mr. Bassett is also, of course, if you beat the host every single week, you figure you got a pretty good total for the year. He's leading the cumulative standing. So he's number one. He's got a chance to make serious earnings on that. And, of course, he's one of about 600 players who have qualified for the beat the host final uh, coming up in March in a couple weeks. So Tom Bassett, a lot of money on the line good luck to you sir uh take down michelle take down eddie uh you know at the beginning of the year i'm rooting for us to beat the public at that point you know you don't want too many people to beat us because it's embarrassing but one guy left for a chance at 6500 i'm rooting for mr bassett absolutely great handicapping i mean it's not easy you know it i know it i mean we do it once a week well we do it once uh, we have a, a stable of handicappers but to do it every week you're going to be on your game and uh, he's uh, done a great job, and let's see how far he can carry it. And the second point to make about the Gulfstream racing on Saturday, it's part of the Coast to Coast Pick 5. Those races have been announced. Uh, Jeff and Brian Netta will have handicapping videos available on all the social media handles for Gulfstream, for Santa Anita, for First and Express Bet. Here's a look at the Saturday races, uh, two from Gulfstream, races 10 and 11, including the Royal Delta Stakes in there as race number 11, three of them uh, from Santa Anita. And if you're playing this weekend, let's go ahead and show you the Sunday lineup as well. Never too early to start handicapping or at least downloading your past performances here's the coast to coast pick five lineup for sunday's racing uh two from Gulfstream, three from santa anita again brian and jeff will have handicapping videos on social media and on the website for first bet and express bet in the blog section and on uh youtube as well so you'll be able to get their handicapping stylings uh, for those races okay jeff let's get back to the handicapping now as we switch uh gears to oaklawn park next up oaklawn's got the razorback stakes Razorback at uh, Oaklawn Park, a prep towards the Oaklawn handicap a little bit later in the meet. But as I mentioned, with the money they're giving away at Oaklawn in the uh, stakes ranks and in the overnight ranks as well, these races are not preps. The Razorbacks are grade three for six hundred thousand dollars. They've got a big field. They've got some good horses involved in it. And look. Everybody wants to win the Oakland handicap at the end of the beat, but nobody's bypassing this six hundred thousand dollar race is just a tune up. So how do you handicap? It? Well, most of these horses are gelding, so it doesn't matter about the grade three, whatever. They just want the money, and six hundred thousand yeah. dollars is a considerable amount for sure. Now, in handicapping this race, Ginobili's coming back. He was very impressive uh, at Oakland last time out in mid January yeah. when he wired the field. But um, there's other space in this race in here, and uh, although he stalked in his last race uh, from the four hole, I, I have a hunch they're going to send him out of there and try to yeah. maybe even get loose in the lead, but if not be in the first flight. There are others in here that have pace. I'm a big fan of Law Professor. Uh, I, 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 I knew him out here at San Anita when he was running. He was running uh, on all kinds of surfaces, but uh, I think he is really good right now. I loved his win in New York, and so much so that I thought they might even – uh, try him in the Pegasus. That came back a little quick. 
But this race is a logical spot for him, and he likes to sit back and make a run. And uh, going to mile on 16th with pace up front, the uh, law professor can, will get the patient ride. I'm pretty sure he's gonna he needs. And if they go too fast early, uh, he could be tough late. Now, he's 7-2 to two in the morning line. I wouldn't take any less than that. I think he might okay. even go a little higher. Um, but he's only had 14 starts. It seems like he's been around a long time, but he's not over race. And I think there's more improvement in him. And again, the 98 buyer number that he earned in his last start, a career top, he wanted eased up. I mean, he could have gone even faster if they had turned him loose. I think Law Professor has found his niche as a kind of a late running dirt, middle, middle distance dirt horse. Mm -hmm. Conditions fit to order. I like Law Professor to win the Razorback. Let's look at his win in the Queens County at Aqueduct. As they approach a quarter mile left to go, Seafoam is losing ground to the inside plot. The Dots is trying to rally on, but Law Professor is now kicked for home, and it is Law Professor doing it very well. An eighth of a mile to go, Law Professor is three lengths in front. Thomas Shelby continues to chase from the back. Dable Aviator, late run here from Bourbonic, but there is no catching Law Professor. Law Professor proving much the best wins the Queens County Easily. Law Professor gets the victory. Naval Aviator over Thomas Shelby in a late run from Bourbonic in one minute, 51 seconds flat. As you mentioned, he should get pace in here with Ginobili, West Willpower, Cattle River, now transfer from Cox to D. Wayne Lucas. An interesting switch up there, but plenty of speed in the Razorback. Let's move our attention now to the fairgrounds on Saturday where there's a bevy of stakes races for Risen Star Day, second biggest day of the season in New Orleans. Of course, about a month from now, they'll run the Louisiana Handicap or the uh, Louisiana Derby and all the big handicap races on the undercard, including the uh, New Orleans Classic. So we've got a lot of prep races throughout a series of divisions. Uh, the fairground stakes is for the turf division. Will be a prep for the Mervyn Muniz stakes. Uh, that big turf stakes at the end of the meet. The Rachel Alexandra will be a prep for the fairgrounds Oaks for the three-year-old Phillies. And then, of course, the Risen Star, the prep for the Louisiana Derby. Let's start with that fairground sticks. Jeff, it's race number 11 on the card Saturday at fairgrounds. A grade three event here, a mile and an eighth. And uh, they'll be on the grass. And some familiar names in here we've seen. Two Emmys, the winner of the pseudo-final Arlington Million at Arlington, the year they named it the Mr. D. You got Tiz the Bomb, a Kentucky Derby alum that a lot of people were familiar with. Pixel 8's been in a lot of big races around the country. So this is a familiar cast. Yeah, I mean, it's a good race. And I, I uh, defaulted to two Emmys. He's beaten me enough times that I'm going to jump on his <laughs> bandwagon. Every time I try to beat him, he wires the field. And although yeah. he got beat last time out by Gentle Soul, um, from where he's drawn, he could inherit the front end, although he doesn't need the lead to win. We saw that two races right. back when he won a stake at Hawthorne. Uh, but again, second off a layoff, um, and I think that he'll be a little tighter here. Uh, mile and an eighth is, you know, it, it's a fine distance for him. That he won't have to go fast the first part. And if they hand him the front end, we know what he can do with it. And right. uh, I think to him, he's, uh, you know, he's a seven-year-old gelding, but he's not been beaten up. He's only had 23 starts. They've taken care of him. And again, second off the bench here, I think he can turn the tables on gentle soul and win. So I like number two, two Emmys, of hopefully gate the wire, but if someone wants it, he can sit second. Either way, two Emmys to win the fairground stakes, the 11th at fairgrounds. We talked about this last week. I think it was, or the week before, when you have the best horse in the race and they get the right pace set up, you just punch it, right? And there does right. not appear to be any speed in here to go with two Emmys, who may be the best horse in the race going in anyway. So uh, that's an advantage. James Graham not likely to give back. The two holes, a perfect draw. You don't have mm -hmm. to worry about the tightness of the rail, but you're there to the inside. You just right. get right over. You hug the pine all the way around, and uh, uh, a two Emmys looks extremely tough to beat. I think I agree with you totally there uh, in the fairground stakes. Now, if that one looks like one that's, kind of on the obvious side that we like. How about this filly? Who's your filly? She's up next in the uh, Rachel Alexandra stakes. The last time we saw her in the golden rod, she was doing this. Who's her filly by the eighth pole by four now? Pure Pauline, knock your socks off. Pretty mischievous, defining purpose. Who's her filly with a five length lead, 100 yards to go. It's another flawless performance. Who's her filly? They're thinking first Friday in May now, under the wire, wrapped up by six. 
Well, that was November, and they were thinking first Friday in May from Travis Stone's call. Now that we're in the February, they're thinking first Saturday in May. They nominated this filly to the Triple Crown. Hoosier filly starts her three-year-old campaign as an odds-on favorite, to be sure, in the Rachel Alexandra Stakes. Chop Chop's in here, who was a nice filly who just hasn't quite moved forward the way we thought she might. I don't know anybody else who's going to warm up Hoosier Philly. I think Hoosier Philly is basically running against herself here. And I say that because she she should win this race. I mean, we, we saw what she did in her last start in the Golden Rod and one eased up. Before that, she won a stakes race by seven on the slop so she can handle any surface. But if she's going to be a serious Kentucky Derby candidate, mm-hmm. um, we'll find out here. I mean, she's going to, yeah. I mean, no one expects her to go out and, and win by 20 or anything like that, right. like Rachel did. Uh, but if she performs up to uh, expectations, uh, then Tom Amos will have to make a decision as to what path he wants to take. I would love to see her win this race uh, like a Derby candidate because it, it, you know, it's, it shows uh, it adds spice to the, the campaign, don't you think? Sure. And oh, um, something we can talk about. And she might be that good. I mean, when you have uh, when you're by end of mischief and out of her by Tappet, there is no limit to what you might be. We know that. Yeah. And the way she won that last race as a two-year-old, uh, I, I think that she is absolutely the best three-year-old filly I've seen. Now the question is, is she good enough to beat the boys? I I wouldn't put it past her, but I'm going to be watching this race, not from a gambling standpoint. Obviously, she'll be odds on, but from a performance standpoint. And I hope that she, she uh, runs as well as I think she's capable. The numbers guys will say tap the brakes, right? She's run 76, 76, and 81 buyers, which are okay, but they're not Rachel Alexandra or winning <laughs> colors, right? Uh, yet, but she was only a two-year-old filly at that point and, and going long in her second start and long in her third start. So uh, they're sealing to improve perhaps and, and get even better. She was under wraps in, in, in a couple of those races. So uh, I'm excited for who's your filly for sure. And, you know, Tom Amos, look, in a triple crown trail that we have documented throughout uh, in our Tuesday show, it's official throughout the course of this campaign so far. It's been all Brad Cox. It's been all uh, uh, Bob Baffert. And it's been Todd Pletcher of late. I mean, those are the three mega dirt barns in America. And they're running for a shot over the triple crown trail. We could use an injection. And boy, that was a really bad pun. But we could use an insertion. <laughs> we could use an insertion of new blood. Uh uh, on the Triple Crown Trail, and she could be the kind of filly that would give it uh, that pizzazz that we were going to look for, uh, that we are looking for. I almost said give us the juice, but after saying the injection and then the juice, that would have been a terrible set of puns uh, uh, to pair up. As <laughs> Take we, a hold, Jimmy. Take parties. a hold. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Send me back to the barn. Uh, let's move on to the Risen Star Stakes. This is our three-year-old Triple Crown big prep of the weekend. We also have uh, the Miracle Wood in Maryland. For uh, There are some Triple Crown nominees in the Miracle Wood, uh, maybe towards the Federico Tessio and then a Preakness bid there. But the real Kentucky Derby prep is this weekend at Fairgrounds in the Risen Star. There's a field of 14 in here, Jeff. And as I wrote in Countdown to the Crown that was published today, uh, I would be a little scared of a field of 14 going a mile and an eighth this early in the year. But this race might do more damage than good to a horse that just has to do too much to win it. Then I went back and looked at the results of the Risen Star. Last year, it was still a mile and an eighth. They had a big field of 10 or 11. And all it did was produce the two, three finishers in the Kentucky Derby and Epicenter and Zannon. So didn't hurt them there. The last time we had a field of 14 in the Risen Star, it was uh, 2019 when uh, the horses from the Risen Star won the Derby in Country House and then also won the Preakness with War of Will. So mile and an eighth, check the box. That's okay. Field of 14, check the box. That's been okay too. I'm less worried about this race than I was just generally looking at it kind of fundamentally like, boy, this is going to be a tough race to win, and whoever wins it could be toast. But instead, they're battle-tested the way it's turned out historically. So this is going to be a very important race. It is. It's a good field. Uh, a lot of um, Colts here that are on the upswing, and there are, several of them are going to produce forward moves, and just a question of uh, how how much they will. Um I, I, I entered the handicapping process here with the idea of trying to beat victory formation because of the draw. Right. Uh, I, I, I don't the 13 hole. Then I realized a mile and an eighth, it's a, a relatively decent run to the clubhouse turn. He's got a chance yeah. to get over. 
I went and watched the Smarty Jones. He had the eight of eight in, in that race again. Uh, <laughs> and he got over. I mean, this horse has got good gate speed. You can place yeah. him wherever you want. He, I, he won that race gate to wire. I'm convinced he doesn't need the lead to win. And I'm also convinced that he's going to have no trouble getting over. Uh, maybe not in front, but I think he's going to be, by the time they hit the clubhouse turn, I think he'll be in a good spot, either on the lead, yeah. probably not, or sitting second, third, or fourth on the outside, just kind of galloping along. Yeah, I, I really was impressed with his last race. I thought, you know, not the fact that only the fact that his buyer numbers keep improving, three starts, he's risen every time, but the athleticism, the quickness, the ability to show early speed, switch off midway, re-break into the stretch, which he did, and win with a ton left. It's hard for me to pick against him. Again, I know that there are several in here that look like they're pretty good. They're going to produce forward moves and step forward, yeah. but they got to be victory formation, and I'm not prepared to pick against them based on what I just saw. Well, let's take a look at what you just saw. Victory formation. He's at the top of the stretch, and he's built up a three-length lead. The whip is out on Western Gen. Angel of Empire is at the rail, and victory formation comes to the final 16th in front by two lengths. Angel of Empire is running a very good race, trying to run down his stable mate, but he's going to be second to the Sparty Jones stakes winner, the undefeated victory formation. And if you don't get enough Brad Cox with the favorite in here, the runner-up uh, Angel of Empire back again uh, in for the rematch. Could be another Brad Cox exact in here. Of course, he's got a third entrant in here as well. Tappet's Conquest will be running on at the end. So if the pace gets fast, uh, some of these Cox horses are going to have a shot from the back of the pack as well. Steve Asmussen's got three in this race as well, not taking a back seat. Doesn't have the headliner that Brad Cox has, but Jeff, he's got Harlow Cap coming off the Bob Baffert transfer portal, as we like to say as mm -hmm. college sports fans. Uh, then we've also got a couple other horses in here. Silver High coming off of a third place finish last time out and a horse i uh, uh, i'm kind of interested in a little bit in is private creed i want to see what he can do but he drew the 14 hole so first time <laughs> on dirt for private creed it's good to be outside if you're a turf horse trying to dirt because you don't get the abrasive kickback a lot of times but i don't know that private creed on the stretch out we don't know if he's a mile on an eighth horse and then he's got to give away ground loss. So it's kind of like mm. a damned if you do, damned if you don't, or one step forward, one step back when you evaluate private creed. But Asmussen's got three in here. And I'll tell you this, I don't know if that's even the uh, the best horse he has on the card. I'm going to give you a horse named First Defender running on the undercard in Allowance Company. Mm -hmm. Sparkling six furlong debut winner. Stretches out in a very tough allowance race at Fairgrounds on Saturday. But again, what a day for Asmussen it could be. He's three wins away from 10,000, too, as we tape our podcast here. I think he's got 13 in on Friday, so there's a chance that he'll get uh, that 10,000th win on Friday. But, boy, I mean, he he could be sitting on a historic day on Saturday uh, with all his horses. So uh, this is a really fun edition of the uh, race at Fairgrounds. What do you make of Harlow Cap, Jeff? Uh, this is the Bob Baffert transfer, four-length winner at Santa Anita last time out uh, in his first time extending to a mile to 16, second route race. In fact, why don't we look at that race, and then you can kind of get another look at it to – to uh, give the fans a shot at it and tell us what you make of Harlow Cap in this spot. Okay. It's been easy going so far for Harlow Cap. Yellow Brick takes up the chase now. He's three behind as they come to the eighth pole. And Harlow Cap, showing no signs of slowing down, maintains a comfortable three length edge. Yellow Brick, second by a block, text the legend. Tiz Tuck, between them, Navy Man are all battling for third. Harlow Cap, dominant in victory, wins it by four and a half. Well, Jer Jeremy, I wanted to like him because um, I'm partial to the California horses. But I honestly don't think he, he – I mean, he's obviously not in Baffert's barn anymore. He's now in Aspen's right. barn because this is the only way he could get points. Yes. But I didn't think he was one of Bob's premier three-year-olds. I would have mm – -hmm. he would have been like – the ninth, the ninth player off the bench. If you're a basketball player, yeah. I mean, he, he, you know, he's got speed. I wouldn't be surprised if they send him. I don't think right. he wants I to think be grabbed. Really yeah. um, but the horse that he beat in that race, Yellow Brick, came back at a short price in a maiden race and got beat. Uh, I don't think he's a, a quality horse. Um, the, those behind him, oh, that race, same thing. He got beaten in his race before last. Uh, got worn down light by another Bob Baffert horse, who I think is an, another. You know, second or third stringer. So I don't right. think he was beating anybody. I watched him train. 
he trains okay, but he doesn't. There's no wow there. Um, and a mile and an eighth might really be stretching his limit, especially with other speed. I, I'm going to gamble against him. Uh, now maybe he's he's only had three starts. He's a justify colt. I mean, he's got room to improve and all that. Right. But there are a number of better horses, I think, in California than him. So after evaluating his form and watching him run and his workouts and everything else, um, I, I just get the impression Victory Formation's just a just a better horse, you know, considerably right. better horse. I have a feeling, a very strong feeling, that we are going to see a horse who wins a triple crown race on the card Saturday at Fairgrounds. There are some really good allowance races on the undercard, mm -hmm. even in the maiden ranks. Right. Uh, these are trainers that support not only the Derby, but run through to the Preakness. Uh, I think you could be looking at a Preakness winner on the undercard or in the Risen Star Stakes. It's always, you know, it's always hard to say, you know, who's going to be the potluck Derby winner sometimes. Uh, but I think that, and, and given the recent history of this series and this particular race, there's no reason to think that that's crazy talk. And what we've seen so far this yeah. year, uh, we are waiting for some of these big horses to come back. We don't know what we're going to get from Forte. We're yeah. going to know what we have from these horses mid-February with one prep left to run after Saturday. So I think there's going to be two or three horses that really step up. Banishing is in that allowance race on the undercard right. for Brendan Walsh. Uh, people, A lot of people love Banishing. I mean, he could be on a lot of top 10 lists, top five lists even. Uh, and he's running against first defender, who I think is like, Right. Top five, top ten quality. Definitely. So that that allows for banishing or first defense, uh, first defender, I think could actually win the risen star. If victory formation is probably a little bit above them right now and the horse to beat, obviously, but those are risen star quality horses who could win that race. And they're running an allowance race on the undercard, and one of them's not going to win the allowance race, you know, it's just a, <laughs> right. uh, just a matter of fact. So, yeah. uh, this is a really good group of three year olds, the most excited I've been so far, uh, this year on the Triple Crown Trail. Let's go to Santa Anita for our uh, final handicapping exercise of the week. It's the Wishing Well Stakes. It'll be race number nine going downhill on the turf, six and a half furlongs uh, for the uh, cowbred fillies and mares in here. And uh, Jeff, want to remind people that uh, we've got a $500 Santa Anita handicapping challenge on Saturday. You can play on track or online at Express Bet. The $500 Santa Anita Handicapping Challenge featuring the races at Santa Anita on Saturday. If $500 sounds a little steep to jump into a tournament, we've got a $40 feeder, just $40 to play in the tournament today on the Gulfstream and Santa Anita races. So uh, be sure to check out our Santa Anita feeder today, $40 entry fee. Get involved with that. ExpressBet.com, the best place online to play handicapping tournaments uh, among the ADWs. The Wishing Well, Jeff Siegel. Where do we uh, dip in and find success here? I like Bay Storm here. Um, she, um, I tried her over a route of ground last time out in the megahertz. They slowed it down, which may not have been to her benefit. Uh, she has right. plenty of speed, and I think maybe they guzzled her too much. And she got nailed late by a, a pretty decent sort of mare, quite well, uh, but still ran well. Now she's back sprinting down the hill. Uh, I think she's going to be very comfortable doing that. Um, she's one of these uh, sprinters that, um, you know, like, you know, can win going to the lead, but she doesn't need to. Um, right. But in a race that on paper doesn't look like there's that much pace in it at all. I mean, I think Bay Storm can maybe grab control early and, and keep on going. Uh, she's by Cantheros. Most of them want to sprint. She's only had 12 starts, first or second, nine out of 12. Her, her numbers, her sprint numbers are very solid. Um, she's coming back a little quick, you know, in two weeks. But I, I, I'm going to assume that Jonathan Thomas knows – Knows this mare pretty well. So I, I'm going to go with Bay Storm. I, I think if she shows up with her A game, she beats this field. One to watch in here, I think, because of the post position is Freedom Flyer. has been down on the inside in these turf sprints down the hill. It's usually the outside post positions that have a little bit of an advantage, the way they kind of dog leg down the hill, and then you kind of avoid a lot at the top of the stretch, cross them back over uh, across the dirt. I like Freedom Flyer a bit here, Jeff. The one hole and the two hole in the last three. Now out in post number eight, Frankie DeTore can keep her out in the clear. I think that's an interesting switch in post positions. And in general, I just like the outside posts uh, when I can you don't want to force anything but when right. you have a horse that you think has a little bit of ability i think the outside could be a little advantageous down the hill 
Uh, let's wrap things up here on this week's First Call Podcast. We're eight races into the handicap. And want to remind you, handicapping tournament today with a $40 feeder. And tomorrow with the $500 Santa Anita Challenge, we've got the Coast to Coast Pick 5 Saturday and Sunday. And then Michelle, use your target this week in the Express Bet Beat the Host Contest. A chance to qualify for the final for Beat the Host and also take down some weekly cash prizes as well. About 600 players, I think, have qualified for the Beat the Host final. What a great response again uh, from Beat the Host. The 18th season of the handicapping tournament, Jeff, and it doesn't seem to lose any popularity or steam. That's a great tournament. Are you kidding? If you're if you're playing, you have to play. You have to play. Because <laughs> uh, let me tell you, we think we're pretty good, but we're not that good. So you can beat us if you want to. If you, you put the work in, it's possible, you know. So, yeah, good luck to all who are participating. Good luck to all who are playing uh, this weekend wherever you're playing, and uh, many of you play all over the place. You take your best from Fairgrounds, San Anita, Gulfstream, uh, Laurel, you know. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. There's winners everywhere. and You know, you got a lot. The menu is large. Pick what you want and dive That's in. That's right. That's how I say it, you know. If you like some additional handicapping content, be sure to check out the blog section at news.first.com and at expressbet.com in the blogs. John White gives you his analysis of the Risen Star Stakes. Frank Caroli, former Maryland Jockey Club handicapper and odds maker, he's got the big pick four at the end of the card on Saturday analyzed at Laurel Park with the Fritchie and the General George involved in that. So you'll want to check out uh, Frank's picks. And, of course, Jeff's going to have you covered uh, soup to nuts, as they say, for Santa Anita for all weekend, including holiday racing on Monday. So be sure to check out the schedules as it's President's Day on Monday. We've got some additional holiday racing. Also want to let you know next Friday was supposed to be a dark day after the holiday at Santa Anita. That has been added as a live racing day, making up for a weather cancellation a couple weeks ago at the Great Race Place. So Santa Anita is going to have racing next week starting Monday and then Friday, Saturday, Sunday uh, with a four-day racing week. So on behalf of everybody with First and my partner, Jeff Siegel, I'm Jeremy Plunk. Enjoy the weekend's racing, and we'll be back Tuesday to recap it all on its official.